Good, out, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to the last week of digital literacy. My name is Justin Hardy, and today we are talking about digital connections. And this is our overview for the evening. So we're going to be talking about finding an online community in your industry, uh, trends and adaptations in the entertainment industry that have happened over the last year and a half, two years, three years. And then we're going to talk about the week four module and activities. And of course, if you're working with me this month and I'm your instructor, please contact me. This is going to be a really um, important week, guys, simply because it's the very last week of the live class. And, or excuse me, it's the very last week of the course. And this is the only week that you can turn in any way, work that you complete this week. There's no waiting until Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of next week because the class will be over. You cannot turn in late work beyond the end of the course this coming Sunday night. So please keep that in mind. I will remind you again. And yes, Joe, we have started the live class. I just want to reiterate right one more time. There is no um, option for late work or extensions for the fourth week of the class, because after this week is done, you guys are in month two, you're moving forward to bigger and brighter things. Please don't let your work get behind you. Um, um, don't get behind all your work. Don't let this get away from you because uh, the final project can be a little involved if you want it to be, but I don't want you guys running out of time. So keep scope um, top of mind when you're working this week and let your instructor know if you feel like you're going to be falling behind or if there might be anything that would prevent you from turning your work in on time. Now is the time for you guys to really communicate with us and let us know what's going on well ahead of the weekend so that we can work with you and maybe provide some options if you feel like you are going to be turning in your work late. Um, but generally, that's not going to be a thing that's allowed. If you try to turn in your work on Monday, next Monday, it will not be accepted. So I just want to make sure that that's out there and clear. And I will reiterate this near the end of the live class. Um, but first, let's talk about online communities here and finding the right place for you. Now, one of the things that we talked about last week was finding a home base. Maybe you might remember that term that I used, home base. Finding a place online, whether it's social media, a personal website that you have, maybe a YouTube channel um, or portfolio website where you host your work, people know where to find you. They can learn a little bit about who you are and what it is that you bring to the table as a professional, right? We talked about seeking that balance. That was all about the self, all about you, all about what you need to do. Now, this is gonna be about the external, finding communities of like-minded individuals who maybe don't share your skill set, maybe don't share your worldview, but they are doing what you want. They're doing the same things that you're doing, they're honing their craft in the same field that you are, and they have varying perspectives that you can lean on or learn from uh, throughout your education, right? So contributing to or being a part of an online community can help you establish your reputation as an industry professional. So this isn't something where you're going to be a wallflower and not contributing to these online communities. You're not just going to show up, learn everything and be a sponge and then go on about your merry way. You will learn some things, but it's not going to be nearly as involved or as immersive as if you were asking questions and contributing what you know to the vast body of knowledge that that online community contains, right? You want to be someone that know, that is known as a fountain of knowledge, as well as being a, a sponge for anything that you want to learn, right? You want to kind of give and take. And no matter your chosen degree, finding like-minded people in an online community can benefit your career because you can get pretty far alone, but you can get further together with other people who are involved in your industry. And like I said before, they're going to provide perspectives that you don't have. They're going to have skills that you don't have, levels of expertise that you might not have reached yet. And all of these things can help you excel faster than you would if you were just kind of flying solo or working in a vacuum. There's only so many things that you can teach yourself. There's only so many things that you can learn. And there's only so many ways you can analyze what your limitations are without someone to bounce those ideas off to, or having the very least a basis for comparison, right? You don't know what you're good at or what your ultimate strengths are without finding someone else that you can compare your, your best against, right? And this doesn't mean that you're in competition, it just means that you're kind of holding up a mirror to who you are and what you're capable of in an earnest way and seeing, okay, I'm good at this, I'm great at this, I need to work on this. And this person is also really good at that. So maybe I can pick their brain, start a conversation with them so I can learn this skill that I feel like is a personal weakness, but it isn't beyond me to conquer it, right? 
So seeing examples of what professionals in your industry are working on can set the bar for your future efforts, of course. Um, just seeing what's out there, knowing what professional work looks like, even if it's world-class professional work that you feel like you're not going to reach for a long time, it's good to know where that bar is set. There's always going to be a maximum level in, in some cases, because if you're working in game art, there are certain limitations placed upon you based on the game engine, your polygon count, and so on. You can only make a model so detailed. So there's going to be a level uh, based on the hardware that you're working for uh, and in terms of how far you can take that. And CGI, it's just a matter of how much time do you have to work on this shot? You might have six months, you might have six weeks, but it has to be done by a set pot time. And there's going to be a set level of detail that you can achieve. So there is, again, going to be a limit. But the sky's the limit in terms of the different styles available, the different levels of expertise, the focuses that certain people have on their artwork versus other people who are jacks of all trades. And they're good at pretty much everything, but there's certain specialties that they are weak in and they recognize that. And that's something they can overcome through collaborations or just simply uh, focusing on that one skill. But just knowing what's out there, what's what, the, what the, the possibilities are can help you with your career trajectory because you'll be inspired by the work that you see, and that might influence how you pursue your, your degree track, right? So what is out there and where are you guys? Are any of you already part of an online community for your industry? Like, have you gone to any websites? Are there any forums that you're using? What are you guys doing right now, if anything? You can sound off in chat if you have any sort of suggestion. Okay, Brittany's just using Discord, which uh, you can't discount Discord. It's a very potent tool, especially if you, have a, if you have several channels that you're a part of or several communities that you're a part of. Noah uses Reddit sometimes. Instagram, okay, cool, cool. So I've got some um, resources for you guys. These are gonna be some repeats from last week. Some of these are gonna be you. Uh, new, but uh, these will give you an idea of what you might want to start looking for in your own pursuit of an online community. So by no means are the ones I'm going to show you the end all be all, but they are some thought starters to get you thinking, okay, maybe this isn't a good fit for me, but I do like this and this. So I'm going to do another search, a research kind of bringing in what we talked about in week two to find a better online community for me. So this is all about discovery, finding what works for you, and maybe having some options to the side where you're not necessarily a full part of that community, but you're aware of it and you have a membership and eventually you can start contributing once you feel comfortable doing so, right? So the first one I wanted to show you is a way, this one's very general, almost anybody can join it. It isn't degree to specific or entertainment business or industry specific. It's just asking general questions. And one of the most important questions that you guys are going to be asking near the end of your degree program is, what should I include in my demo reel? Of all the work that I've created, throughout my degree, what is the best and how can I most efficiently and evocatively show that off, what my capabilities are, what my skills are. And you only have one or two, maybe three minutes maximum to do that. So how do you boil down an entire degree's worth of skills and understanding and insights and perspectives into two to three minutes, maybe one and a half minutes maximum, depending on the requirements of the specific company you wanna work for. Sometimes I just want it to be very quick and snappy, some companies will give you a little bit more leeway to show what you're capable of. But no matter what it is, you want to definitely get an idea of what you need to bring to the table for an entry level position in your chosen field. And Quora is a great way to kind of get some answers to those general questions that may not specifically apply to you, but it may bring up some information that you maybe didn't consider in the past. So what should you include in your demo reel? You got some related questions here. So if you don't have answers, for this specific question that you see several answers for, there are alternate questions here or related questions here that you can jump to in case you're looking for a more specific um, version of your question. And hopefully there's some answers here. Some of them don't have answers, some of them do. So it's a matter of kind of poking around, maybe doing a couple of searches, asking your own questions and seeing what's out there. Uh, there's no question too wild for Quora. I've seen some crazy stuff on here, but it's gonna be a fantastic resource for young um, industry professionals only because you never know who's gonna respond to you, right? It could be someone who's an industry luminary. It could be someone in the same position as you, but if they're going to be answering your question, they probably have something to contribute that is going to be valuable and is going to help answer what you're looking for in at least some way, right? And then maybe you can rephrase your question or use that as the basis for some individual research that you do beyond that, play, that point, right? So I'll go ahead and link this in chat 
for you guys, just as something that you can play with and start using. Um, by no means is this a community that, uh, that is going to be focused on your degree program. It's very general. So I wanted to kind of start there and then dive into something that's a little bit more specific. So we've got ArtStation here, which we covered last week, but I just wanted to hit this website again to talk a little bit about what I mentioned earlier about just knowing what, where the bar is set. So if you're in graphic design or computer animation, this is going to be essentially where your bar is for the top, top, tippy top end of um, your industry, where people are just who are utterly exceptional at what they're doing. Like this is a light study of, a, I think this is 2D. This is very, very good piece of artwork here, right? And this can be like, okay, so this is kind of where I need to kind of set my trajectory to. I am not a character designer. I'm just kind of speaking hypothetically. I'm not a character designer, but I do like the way that this looks. I want to learn how to do this, or I want to move my creative skills in this direction. And if you're going for, say, maybe something that's 3D, this could be, again, another piece of inspiration. You're like, oh, this is... Let's see, um, this looks like a design from Destiny, but I don't know if it's just generic or not, but this is really good work here. And this can, again, adjust your trajectory based on the inspiration that you get from people who are in your industry doing some of the things that you want to do, right? And we all start somewhere. You're, um, this is going to be, again, some people who are in their industry for maybe five or 10 years. So this is gonna be experience stacked on top of experience stacked on top of professional experience and practice and all of that, right? So it's kind of unfair to compare yourself as a student to work like this of working professionals, but it is good to know what that standard is. And there's a whole gamut spectrum of, of quality in between this super high-end stuff and some of the more low-end double-A budget sort of stuff that's still really good, but it's not going to take six or seven months for your model to be finished so that you can actually start shooting your CGI film, right? There's a lot of work that goes involved in this, and if your production, which was, is one of those limitations that I mentioned earlier, time is going to be a huge limitation, scope is going to be a huge limitation, there's just going to be certain things for certain projects that you cannot do. This would not work for a 2D animated television show. This is too much, right? Way out of left field. So something like this might be a better fit, but this is also, again, very detailed for a 2D animation show where you're drawing every single frame. You have to consider scope, you have to consider the purpose of this artwork. So it might be super uh, omega detailed, but it isn't something that you should shoot for professionally only because maybe you don't want to work in film and television and CGI, and you want to maybe work on games instead, or you want to work on mobile devices where, again, your scope and your artistic constraints are going to be completely different and they're going to demand different skills of you but it's great to see what's out there and the gamut of level of how just how far people can take the medium right so that's art station i believe i linked that in chat let's move on to cg society again i'm not going to go through the same spiel but if you're in animation this is going to be a lot of the same things that i just spoke about but in the 3d verse you're going to see lots of different skilled levels on display here most of it excellent but a lot of these are going to be um, hobbyist artwork or pieces that don't have a temporal constraint attached to them. There's no schedule involved with producing a piece of work like this. It's probably a study. It's probably some sort of practice or just something that they wanted to work on in their free time and they could spend all the time in the world on it. Or perhaps this is concept art that was delivered in within a deadline, right? It's hard to sell if they don't include any of that information in here, but it is really cool to kind of, again, see what the, where, where the bar is and just how far the medium can be taken for um, your specific discipline, right? So that is CG Society. The next one is Future Producers. So if you're into music, this is a great place to start in terms of finding other like-minded individuals who are involved with music production. This could be composing, this could be mixing and mastering, it could be engineering, it could be sampling. There's all sorts of different perspectives here that for you to engage with. And there's 30,000 threads with 20, with uh, 211,000 messages. So you can see just even in a given um, form here, there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of knowledge that you can grab from this. And this isn't something where you would use just future producers as your form of choice. This would be maybe one of three or one of five that you're a part of, right? You want multiple perspectives. Why not have multiple online communities involved in the same umbrella of your degree program to kind of mix and match and choose through and kind of visit as you need them. You can think of them as the equivalent of villages, small towns, maybe a medium-sized town, and then you've got your big cities and your metropolises. Some of these online communities are going to be huge. 
some of them are going to be small and intimate and you guys have to find a, what the best fit will be for you do you want to contribute to something uh to an online community that's a little bit smaller more tight-knit where your commute your contributions will mean more or do you want something where there's just thousands of threads thousands of messages thousands of people involved and you kind of kind of have a sea of information that you can again navigate contribute be a part of it learn from it and that sort of thing you have to think about what your specific needs are and how you want to approach your online communities for me i would like something a little bit more intimate where the things that i say have meaning and they can influence people a little bit more and that i can be influenced by the conversations that are had right so that's future producers this is studio binder for our film folks we'll throw this one out there and yes youtube can be a community there's all sorts of voting here about maybe films that are covered specific techniques that are covered um and again youtube can be a fantastic supplemental source of education that can teach you things that you learn in your class in a more honed and specific way say you're in 3d um, or you're in computer animation and you learn compositing well, you only have maybe one or two classes on compositing, but you feel like that's something you really latch on to. You can come to a YouTube community, find a 3D artist or a visual effects artist who focus on that specific um, discipline, all the tools involved, the hardware and the software involved, and that can give you a deeper dive into your specific discipline. And it can, again, aid you in your overall education by giving you one thing that you can kind of specialize in and really bite and sink your teeth into, even if you're no longer learning a grade for it, and you can get your regular track education and learn new techniques that way too. And you know, eventually that process will repeat itself. You'll find another really wonderful thing that you learn in class, you wanna do a deeper dive. And then again, these online communities that are out here waiting for you can provide that deeper dive uh, into those specific techniques that you do wanna focus on, right? So that's Studio Binder. We've also got student filmmakers which is a more traditional form for our student folks out there, or for our film folks out there who um, don't want to maybe use YouTube and don't want to focus on this, or they can use these two things in conjunction. So you can use Studio Binder and you've got your student filmmakers um, or online community. So you're using both of these in tandem. So you can see techniques actually being used in practice and how those techniques were formed and how they're applied. And then you can discuss those techniques here, have further elaboration and have conversations and debates on what those techniques are actually best used for or how they can be implemented in a new original way based on what you saw in a film that was more mainstream, maybe even more, maybe even independent films that are kind of doing secret things that aren't being um, necessarily used in mainstream films yet, but it's very experimental sort of things that may blow up in the future. I can think of the Blair Witch Project as one of those indie sort of movies that was really low budget, really small, and some of you probably have never heard of the Blair Witch Project, thinking about that right now. It's a really long time ago, but if you've ever seen a found footage horror movie where it looks like it's shot on a camcorder or, or some sort of device where it's all shaky and you've got people who are scared and it doesn't feel like you're following a script and it looks like you found footage of something that actually happened. The Blair Witch Project was one of the very first movies that shot, uh, that was shot in that specific style where it looks like you found stuff that was left behind by those that were dearly departed due to some horrible circumstance, right? So you have that trendsetter that was really, really basic kind of under, underfunded, but it spawned a whole lot of different higher budget films that we don't see as much anymore, but every now and again, those tropes do show up, right? It never, it's one of those movies that was not very good, like um, like Jada Prophet says, but Britney says it has never been forgotten. It's one of those films that even if you don't like it, it's got some redeeming fa factors that um, are in evocative, and they're immersive in terms of a, audio, a viewing experience for the audience. You really kind of get enraptured into it, even if it's not the best made thing, right? So this is, again, one of those forms where you can discuss those sorts of things. Like, yes, Joe, Paranormal Activity is exactly the films that I were thinking of that were shot, that really green film. I think it was like a green filter that they used for. It was one of those films that they used, like a green filter, like it was shot on a handy cam or a security camera in the area of smartphones where you could use just your smartphone to shoot one of those films. I think that's one of the reasons that they kind of went away. Cameras are too good now, right? Next one is writingforms.com. And this is for our entertainment business and media communications folks. And this is a smaller um, online community that I kind of talked touched on earlier where it's more intimate. There's a bit of a hurdle that you have to jump to kind of be a contributing member to one of these 
uh, smaller communities because they're not just going to accept your word because you're brand new. Um, they're wanting to see that you are going to stick around for the long haul, that you have quality things to say, that you have quality contributions to the discussions. Um, a lot of the things that we guys have been asking you to do in your discussions this month have been training you to learn how to operate within an online community. So those things do have purpose. We are teaching you guys to kind of interact with strangers that are like-minded. Some of you guys are interacting with other people who are going to be in your degree track. You will see them throughout your entire uh, career here at LA Film. All of this is practice for this real, real stuff right here, where you're going out and interacting with people who have no connection to you whatsoever, no reason to respect you. You've got to make them respect you with your skills, what you know, with what you know, and how you structure any questions that you might ask. You might be a student and you might be learning, but there's a way for you to structure that in such a way that professionals will be more than happy to interact with you. If you go in there and you try to spout all the things that you've learned in class and it's not within any context that you just kind of do it to do it, and you're trying to flaunt that will not get you very far in one of these small knit communities. So you have to kind of read the room, have an understanding of what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what language people are using versus what language that they're not using. Is there moderation? Is there any sort of rules that you have to adhere to to make sure that your time in this community is constructive? And that goes for any online community. There's going to be a terms of service. There's going to be rules and conducts, a uh, conduct for how you should carry yourself. So if you're being professional in the discussions that you're being graded for and you're getting good grades on those and you're having a good time, all that practice can apply directly to these online communities without much uh, much difficulty, right? That's the reason we're having you do them. And the last one I wanna show you guys is Reddit. And this is for the music production folks, but again, you will find threads in some of these subreddits that are gonna be really interesting. Like if you could be a fly on the wall in any alive, famous producer studio and watch them work, who would it be? You've got Hans Zimmer, you've got Ludwig Gorenson, Stu McKenzie, you've got some names that I've never heard of before in here, Steve Albini. So it's great to kind of get an understanding of like, what do people in your industry really think about in terms of certain hot takes? Like if you could be in the studio with anybody, who would you pick and why? That sounds a lot like a discussion prompt that we would ask you, right? But right here, this is live, this is out in the open. Anybody can answer this. And there's 233,000 members, 239 are on right now. And this thread has 98 comments on it and it was produced 10 hours ago, right? So again, this is just one of those avenues. And this is the music production subreddit. So I'll go to the main subreddit and add this to you too, add this to chat. And this goes, um, Reddit has subreddits, they're called subforms for pretty much every single thing that you can think of, computer animation, entertainment business, media communications, um, film, you can see music here, graphic design, animation, every track that we cover here at LA Film, there's a subreddit for it. There's probably, probably more than one subreddit for it, depending on how deep you want to get with this. In fact, usually there's some right here, like you can see music production deals, promote your music, music production memes, musical, musical rejections, right? So these are related communities to the music production um, subcommunity that you can, again, join and be a part of and have multiple avenues to learn from like-minded individuals who are working on and thinking about and doing the same things that you're going to be doing in, in your classes, right? Some of these are people are working professionals. Some of them are hobbyists. Some of them are students like you. And it's going to give you, again, a wide set of people to interact with, learn from, and talk to. And I think that's extremely valuable. Reddit is a great time waster but it is also a phenomenal place to learn from professionals and all from all walks of life, right? And we'll save this Mandalorian stuff for a little bit later. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. But again, I just wanted to make sure that you guys are aware of online communities, what's out there. There's a small sampling that I included in chat, but I, by no means are the ones that I showed you probably going to be the best for you. Some of them might be a good fit for now, but you might outgrow them and find something a bit better later on as you continue your research and you continue learning uh, the, the aspects of your degree. So we talked about what's out there and we talked about how these networks can uh, they can give you a luck up in your career because again, you never know who's a part of these forums. And if you start contributing and people see you asking interesting questions and engaging discussion in discussions in constructive ways, like you're bringing something to the table, 
that creates a memory. Like people are going to start seeing your handle, your username, and associating positive things with you. And if you know your stuff and you're contributing, and people can see your work and they've got access to your home base, they can see your social media, they can check out your SoundCloud or your YouTube channel or whatever it happens to be. These can be potential job opportunities for you, right? Especially if you're part of more than one online community. You never know who's out there. You never know who's interacting with you. So if you put your best foot forward and you create those best first impressions that we talked about last week in week three, um, you never know, well, again, where an opportunity can arise. Someone says, hey, I really enjoyed reading your post. I saw some of your work. I listened to some of your work. I have this job opportunity. I need someone to engineer this, this, and this for me. Would you be interested? And your answer is probably going to be yes, right? And how much legwork did you really have to do? Well, you were going to be engaging with an online community anyway. You were going to be sharing your knowledge anyway. You were going to be learning anyway. And people take um, notice of that and they want maybe provide you an opportunity while you're still in school. Like, so you could probably start your career, jumpstart your career in a small way by interacting with these online communities, getting a couple of small gigs while you're still honing your craft. So by the time you graduate, you've got a miniature portfolio that's parallel to the one that you were creating in, in um, school. So you can kind of work those two things together. You can exercise those professional contacts that you've um, fostered and curated in those online communities throughout your degree program. And that can, again, give you a leg up in your career. It can give you several contact points. It can give you just several job opportunities that are just waiting for you. And all you've got to do is collect your degree and then you're off to the races, right? So plant those seeds early. You never know how they can germinate. It's just a matter of finding the right place for you, the right fit for you. And I don't expect you guys to find that on week four of month one. So give it some time. And this week's projects are all about how to explore that for yourself and to get an understanding of what might be the best fit for you and where you might find the best fit for you, right? So specialized form boards, just to kind of reiterate some of this information, are often smaller and focused on a single subject to support those tight-knit communities. So writing forms is one of those that I mentioned earlier. And then this is from Quora, a very first thing that we covered. Uh, the question and answer threads can provide niche advice and assist in troubleshooting issues with your gear. So you never know who knows what they know, and you can use that information in something like Quora to ask those general questions and hopefully someone will come to your rescue. And sometimes it's just a matter of Googling the actual concern that you have. And if a core thread doesn't pop up, a Yahoo Answers thread will, or maybe even a forum post to a new online community that you didn't know existed, they have an answer to your question. And that's just a new spot for you to find a knowledge for your degree. You never know where these, um, these uh, this your research is gonna take you and where these forum threads can take you, right? So let's talk a little bit about industry adaptations and trends that have been happening over the last three years or so now the coronavirus has kind of worked its way through the world and it's kind of, it's become a background thing. It hasn't gone away. People are still suffering from it. In fact, one of our uh, instructors recently caught it. It's not a thing that's gone away, but it is something that has been reduced to such a level that we've kind of got our normalcy back and you can probably hear the hesitation in my voice, right? It's not something that's, a, that's we're not clear, clearing away from it just yet. So the 2020 pandemic, change the landscape for how professionals connect in the real world and the online world. I know around March of 2020, we were all doing this. We're on our computer, we're working remote, we still got the mask on anyway, right? Better safe than sorry. So it's all about being prepared and having a game plan because the last couple of years have shown us that things can change very quickly. They, things can pivot very quickly and we've got to be agile enough as professionals to make sure that we can adapt and kind of not predict, but have preparations in place in case anything that does happen that has wider ramifications won't affect us individually as much. You have a game plan, you have an exit strategy, right? So the entertainment industry has entered a new era with previously unseen pressures, remote work being the biggest one of them. Uh, a lot of entertainment products are built in a collaborative environment with sometimes hundreds or thousands of people. And if a good portion of those people are all at home, and they're not able to do live collaboration where you just can't get up and go to the art director's cubicle and ask him about a background that you're working on and get his advice and then he'll go back to your cubicle maybe show you a couple of pointers a bit of technique here but you maybe add some information here like there's no face-to-face -face interaction where you can really have those snap decisions those snap collaborations 
and that you would be able to have if everyone were in the same building, in the same office working on the same thing. If there's Slack involved, Discord involved, Microsoft Teams involved, there's gonna be that conceptual disconnect where collaboration becomes a lot more difficult to maintain, right? You all know how easy it is for words that are written down without any sort of context to be misconstrued. You might read a tone in someone's sentence that isn't actually there, or it might be opposite of the actual intended tone. But if you don't have that person there to enunciate to you out loud, that email, that message might seem rude. I'm sure we've all had this misinterpretation before. Imagine that in a work environment where you're working on a video game and you've got tons of moving pieces and you don't have the ability to speak to the guy that you need to, who usually sits right next to you. He's on lunch. You've got to wait for an hour for him to come back. And then you've got to remember what your initial problem was in the first place. And then you've got to sit him down. Maybe you jump on Zoom and have a face-to-face -face meeting. But again, there's going to be a lot of moving pieces that are moving even more so because you, again, you can't actually physically interact with the person that you need to talk to, right? So there's lots of pressures there. There's lots of pressures with supply chains being interrupted, which has been alleviated. There's also um, issues with certain companies having um, ethical problems where they're not able to retain employees because they're higher management. Just they got caught doing things very weirdly during the pandemic, either financially or ethically within the company. You've seen shakeups there, which is preventing work from being accomplished. There's all sorts of different um, factors involved in this and you have to be prepared, right? So think about any video games that you wanted to come out or that you were hoping to come out um, on time during that 2020 to 22 era. Lots of things got delayed. The Last of Us 2 got delayed. Cyberpunk got delayed for a couple of video games. Live concerts. I think The Weeknd had a concert that he had to postpone several times. Think about movies that you guys were looking forward to. I think Dune and The Batman with Robert Pattinson got delayed due to the pandemic. I think one of the Mission Impossible films, the latest one with Tom Cruise, well, there are, he, pretty much Tom Cruise does all of them, but the latest one, I think, again, had delays or some sort of issues related to COVID. Netflix has been canceling shows left and right due to COVID. Um, back when it was like a thing that was ravaging everybody and everything, they were canceling shows left and right because you need a production staff all together to be able to shoot them. You can't shoot them with a skeleton crew. It's not how some of those productions work. So instead of just kind of postponing and kind of letting the show kind of pause, they're only just gonna cut their losses and then um, kind of prevent any sort of closure for any fans of those particular series. Sometimes movies just don't get made. I think the Batgirl or Batwoman, Batgirl, Batwoman, well, recently got canned. It was completely shot, ready to go. And for some reason, the Warner Brothers just doesn't want to release that film. And I don't know if that has anything to do with COVID or how it was shot or the production processes that were involved with it, but productions are being disrupted in a lot of different avenues and a lot of different um, degree programs, a lot of different industries. And it's something that you guys want to maybe keep your pulse on going forward. And think about sporting events, the most important sporting event of every decade, every couple of decades, the Olympics got postponed an entire year, right? It was supposed to be the 2020 Olympics. It ended up being the 2021 Olympics. And I was so stoked for the Tokyo Olympics as it was occurring. And then the coronavirus happens. That was one of the first things that I was worried about. What's going to happen with the Olympics? Well, we weren't going to have them that year. Japan delayed as much as they could. Because if they canceled the Olympics, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but if Japan decided to cancel, cancel the Tokyo Olympics for 2020, they would have been on the hook for $35 billion that they would have had to pay all sorts of people, mostly the Olympic uh, International Olympic Committee. They would have to pay that money out of pocket. And that would have been too much to bear. So if they were like, you know what, let's keep everything where it is. Let's wait a year do it next year in 2021 and hopefully things will be a little bit better and again the arena was, arenas were sparse almost no foreigners were allowed there the stands were empty the athletes really didn't have anybody to perform for they were just doing their job and hopefully they got a medal at the end of it right so no matter your chosen industry everything was affected video gaming um, live concerts movies television it's sporting events, any sort of production that was out there, whether it's something that was entertaining or whether it was legal people in the back who were kind of making sure that all the paperwork was uh, taken care of. There were disruptions all over the place, right? And you have to think about what would you do? So let's say you're a lighting artist, let's say you're a 3D modeler, let's say you're an editor for a film, an engineer, an AR representative, right? A PR representative. 
what would you do? How might cancellations and delays of large scale productions affect the production staff working on them? There's going to be layoffs. There's going to be uh, furloughs. There's going to be all sorts of things that are going to affect your ability to pay rent, to feed yourself, to take care of your kids, right? So you want to have some sort of backup plan. You don't want to be caught unawares with your production being shut down due to circumstances outside of your control. You have hopefully have made some friends in your industry. You've made some contacts. You've done some networking. You're going to notice that other people are going to be laid off too. You might like, hey, do you have anywhere that you're going to go? Yeah, I'm going to this production studio. They also need some other people for this. Let's get a whole bunch of group and go over there and they can kind of they can kind of make their case that, hey, this production got canceled. Here's the work that we've done. We all know how to work together. We know that you need this hire us. And I'm sure this has happened many, many times, various permutations of that very same conversation, right? So what would you do? Think about your current situation. Think about your skills as they stand. As a student, you probably have limited options, but as you gain skills and as you do now, as you begin networking within your online communities that you choose, um, as you get your name out there, um, opportunities will open up, options will open up, and you'll have a better sense of security when it comes to your industry being maybe a little bit unpredictable. The entertainment industry is unpredictable at the best of times. In the last couple of years, I've kind of laid that bare. So have a good understanding of what it is that you want to do and an exit strategy in case things go belly up because you never know, right? So you have to think about how you can adapt and thrive in a changing industry. And since things are being overhauled, new standards are being set, you guys can get in at the ground level for companies that are going to be accustomed to having employees who work remotely. So you're not traveling all over the country and relocating and having to move from where you are. If you have the right skills and you interview well and you do all the right moves, you can work remotely doing exactly what you wanted to do from the comfort of your own home. That's what I'm doing right now, right? So it's one of those things where you have to plant your seeds, you have to see what's out there, you have to read the industry, you have to read the world and have a game plan that constantly changes and adapts so that you can thrive in your chosen industry for the long haul, right? And since priorities have shifted, the strategies that the industry has used in the past are evolving and changing and becoming more efficient in terms of production. And that's where I wanted to introduce the concept of digital sets, because we're going to have you guys kind of talking about advancements and adaptations in your chosen industry. And I want to use this one for film because it's one of the most obvious ones, because I'm sure there's several people in here who have seen The Mandalorian, the television show, and it is shot beautifully. And one of the things that they use to shoot this show so well is their digital sets that we can see here. So digital film sets, virtual environments, and other high-tech production strategies are growing in popularity. In fact, I have some extra screenshots here to kind of illustrate the point of how these, um, these shows are shot. So you can see here that there are these pieces here that connect the ceiling to the wall, but you can see that it's a photorealistic projection that is casting light on all of your practical environment here, right? So if we zoom out of it, you can kind of see how things are structured. You have your roof panel here that project, projects your, your, your sky. You've got your side panel here that projects your vista. And then you've got your practical set here in the middle. And notice how few people there are in this shot and in this shot. You no longer need an army of people, an army of CGI artists to actually shoot a, a, a television show at this particular budget level. This is gonna be very expensive. Not a lot of television shows are doing this. I doubt Disney is willing to share their, uh, their, their groundbreaking technology, right? Not for a while at the very least. But one of the benefits from shooting digitally on a film set like this is that again, reduced number of staff, and two, you no longer have to bother with shooting on location. So let's say you wanted to shoot a shot like this in the Nevada desert. You don't have to wait to the right conditions. You don't have to worry about it being too hot or it raining on you or the lighting conditions not being perfect. You can define all of this because none of this is real. This is all 3D geometry. So if you want it to be in the middle of the day, cool. If you want it to be overcast or evening or night or foggy or clear as day or a blue sky, you can change all of those things on the fly with no sort of reshoots. You don't have to wait for the right time period. There's no downtime. You can shoot all of your shots back to back to back and create something, again, that is cheaper in the long haul, but a lot more expensive upfront with the technology that you need to develop to be able to do something like this in the first place, right? So I believe the first season of The Mandalorian was $120 million. That's the budget that they had. 
this is probably about 70 to 80 percent of it getting all of this set up getting all of the geometry in here and once you have all of it set up you no longer have that cost that's going to be amortized over the fact that you can now shoot on this on this set as many times as you want to you can do several thousand different uh, cuts or different uh, shots on this particular set and all of them could be completely different but you wouldn't know that when you look at the final product that it was all done in the same area right you could shoot on a completely different planet indoor outdoor no matter what you need you can do it with this setup and i imagine in the next five to ten years you're going to see independent films kind of taking up the banner of this technology and you might eventually see movies that are shot in someone's garage but you would have absolutely no clue that they shot it in their garage because the, the scene extensions and digital film sets like this like if you shoot it in a clever way and you use your plot props in a clever way you can extend a garage space into a gigantic spaceship if you shot it right and you did it just correctly like you would probably need maybe a five or ten person crew for that whereas before if you wanted to do something like that on a sound stage with a green screen and multiple cameras you're looking at maybe 40 50 people there right you can produce the number of staff that you need and gain visual fidelity far above what you would get otherwise and you have complete control of it too and the unreal 5 engine that they're using for this is in public hands in fact i have a copy of unreal 5 on my pc so if i ever wanted to learn this and get accustomed to the unreal engine workflow and maybe apply for a job like this in a couple of years after i get a handle with it that is within my scope of purpose. I, I could totally do that and that's one of the reasons that they amount like they allow Unreal Engine to be free is because they're essentially training people to be able to do this in the future, where the, whereas there's only a couple of specialists now. So if you're in animation and you're at all interested in what you're seeing here, pick up Unreal Engine 5 once you get your tech kit, learn about Unreal Engine 5, learn about Unity, because having those skill sets in your back pocket can pay dividends with technology like this that's still in its infancy, right? This is only maybe five or six years old as a technology. Imagine where it's gonna be in a decade, right? And you could be in on the ground floor for something like that. And this is just, again, one example of an innovation that's happened in the last couple of years uh, that has changed the game for the ability um, of professionals to kind of have complete control over their output creatively, and they can do it in an efficient way with few staff, and they have more creative expression all the same, right? So instead of you seeing your regular green screen here, you now have this sophisticated advancement in a, an evolution of technology from what we see here to what we see here. All right, so that's all that I have for you guys in terms of lecture material. Let's now go over the activities for this week. And I've got several examples of the final project that I'm going to go over and show you what those look like before we part ways tonight. Okay, so the first one is a 4.1 activity. You guys know the deal here. This is the response question that you're going to get. If you did well for the first three weeks, continue in that vein for week four. And our question is, do you feel that actively participating in online communities with your peers is beneficial to your success? Why or why not? We talked about several reasons today as to why you would want to do this. So definitely go back and uh, listen to the live class recording. If you're kind of unclear on what those are, you might have already answered this question earlier today. You can even answer it right now while these concepts are fresh in your mind. So definitely take care of this before the Sunday night deadline, because again, no link we work will be accepted for the assignments that you're working on this week. Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Pacific, is the hard deadline for all of your coursework for week four. And there's your next, your second reminder, right? So 4.2 is going to be a digital communities assignment where we have you guys investigate some online communities, see what the benefits are, bring a screenshot back to us so we can see a conversation that's had, uh, being had on that uh, particular online form and kind of what you glean from it. Good things, bad things. We want you guys to analyze some of these online communities that we've kind of discussed throughout this evening, right? And you'll be picking two, and these aren't the two you have to stick with, but we just want you to kind of get an understanding of what you like, what you don't like, what you're looking for. And um, so no screenshots will be accepted of the entire uh, of the entire document, Harold, but we ask you to embed a screenshot of, uh, of a forum post. And I will go over that very, very shortly here. So there's two different things there. You can't take an image of your entire, um, submission and use that as a screenshot. I'm going to show you what that means in here in just a couple of minutes. 
4.3 is going to be your discussion for this week where we talk about industry trends and adaptations and several things that we talked about just uh, recently in terms of digital film sets and the level of control that you get over using that technology. Whereas before you're using green screen sets and those weren't nearly as good. There's a lot of limitations that you no longer have with digital film sets. And then 4.4, the Digital Literacy Creative Production Project, where we have you guys kind of uh, take a aspect of the course, a concept in the course that you really enjoyed, really resonated with you, and build a project around it. And there's several things that you want to keep in mind as you're working on this, and I will go over all of them. The instructions for this are fairly long, but we are only asking for a couple of things, and I'm going to show you what that's all about right now. Let's get these tabs out of here. 4.1, once again, do you feel that actively participating in online communities with your industry peers is beneficial to your success? Why or why not? And the recording will be posted up here after our session is done, if you're working with me. So you can kind of scroll around and go back to that material that I covered if you want to make sure that your answer is as accurate as possible. Okay, 4.2, zoom in a little bit here. So in this assignment, you will review a new or existing membership and communities connected to your degree program. And we've got some sites below that you guys can use as thought starters, but not by no means are we locking you into these. You can choose something that you're already a part of. Like you can, if it's a Discord channel, you can use that rather than using the forms that we have here. So definitely don't feel like you're handcuffed to what we show you here. So we've got two each for digital film, animation, production, music production, graphic design, entertainment business, writing for TV and film and media communications. So definitely go through these, they're fairly solid, but if you have something that you want to use instead, by no means are you limited to these. Just want to reiterate that one more time. So step one, from the list of uh, community sites above or one that you choose, choose one that you find interesting and look into how they're set up and what they can offer you. And in the completion field at the bottom of this assignment, so right here is where you're putting your information, right here, not the feedback area, but the completion area, just above it. So that's where your information is gonna go. And you're, you're going to provide answers to the following prompts, and your answers should be at least four to five sentences in length, giving us the necessary detail and explanations, right? So which online community did you choose, and what was your reasoning for that selection, and include a URL to that specific community? What did you like? What did you not like? Did you see any conversations that you were interested in? Did you find any tutorials that you were interested in or FAQs that you found interesting? Like, what was your reason for that selection? Four to five sentences there. And after reviewing the community message board, what are some of the topics and issues being discussed and how are they relevant to the community, right? So what's being discussed? Are they talking about pay rates? Are they talking about controversies? Are they talking about new hardware, new software? What types of things are being discussed in this online community? Why is it important? Why is it relevant? And how do you think it can help you? And then please embed a screenshot of an example post from your chosen online community. So you're going to be taking a screenshot of your online community. So for example, if I go to music production here, I really like that one thread that we're talking about here. Uh, if you could be a fly on the wall, and then I see some answers here that I like, Hans Zimmer is a woman, and then I take a screenshot of that. That's one part. That's the first part. And then you're going to come back here to 4.2, and then you're going to embed that screenshot. So that will look something like this. I actually can't do it here. Um, that's unfortunate. So you would press this button here, and then you would paste the drag and drop the image here, and then insert it, and it will be inserted into the completion area here. What we don't want is a screenshot of your answers and the questions and the actual screenshot that you did, because that's going to be kind of weird. Like, we don't want screenshots of that. We want an embedded screenshot from the online community that you chose. So something from here, and then that will be a part of your answers that you're going to be completing for this bullet, this bullet, and then down here is going to be your evidence of what you saw on that online community, right? So screenshots will not be accepted as a submission for this assignment, meaning that you're not going to paste a screenshot here of your questions, of the questions and your answers and your screenshot. Like that would be super weird for you to include, but we have seen it in the past. Like we also don't want you to take a screenshot of your laptop screen because you can't submit your work. That's also, again, Harold, what we were talking about. There's lots of little edge cases that sometimes students will try to get away with. And we want to make sure that we have a catch all so that we can apply specific caveats. So hopefully that answers your question. You will be embedding a screenshot from an online community, but you will not be taking a screenshot of your submission and submitting that. Okay, anyway, 
So that's going to be your 4.2 activity. Answer this bullet point, answer this bullet point, embed a screenshot of a picture of a conversation from your online community for the 4.2 activity. And again, you will place in, be placing that information in the completion area right here. And for your grade, it's going to be a 90-10 split. We're looking for those answers to be four to five sentences in length. So you follow in sit advance column. And we're also looking for that community link. So you're going to link to a community as well. There's three things that we're looking for. So a URL, your answer to this question, your answer to these two questions, and then an embedded screenshot. So there's three components, the 4.2. And that's going to be 90% of your grade. And then 10% will be writing mechanics. So run spell check, check for typos, make sure that you are crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Now, next one, let's go through your discussion post here. So we want you to look at and consider trends and adaptations that have happened in your chosen industry. And some of those that are going to be, some of them were going to be obvious, like Zoom, Microsoft Team, Discord, and Slack have kind of seen a boom because of remote work. But there's also things that are going to be industry specific, like digital film sets for filmmaking. Like, so look for something specific in your field. So you want to perform a search uh, for the first part for your initial post. Um, we want you to perform a search for articles that reference any changes or adaptations that have occurred in your chosen industry. And you want to hold on to these articles because you're going to be using at least one of them. We want we look for articles that address the overall impact of these changes, what may have caused these changes, what kind of pressures were there, and any adaptations that your degrees industry has made to continue production. How have they kind of gone around this obstacle to continue moving on, right? So there's two prompts below that you're going to answer. And for the first prompt, find a relevant article link and then link the URL with your answer. So you're doing a little bit of research and you're gonna be citing that research in your answer for your first prompt, right? So for question one, there be, better be a link attached to this one, right? And be sure your answers are written in your own words and not copied and pasted directly from your articles. Sometimes you do see that. Um, there are things called parenthetical or in-text citations. We are not looking for you to do that. We don't want to see any information from the article other than your opinions and information that you glean. So you can say, according to this article that I link below, this, 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 and this, but it better be written in your own words. Please don't copy and paste. You will lose points. You will lose points. So what is an example of an industry technology, production release date, or industry process or practice that was altered or modified due to unforeseen changes in your chosen field? So think about game releases, album releases, concerts, table reads, film shoots, meetings, voiceovers, like all of those different things were affected. And what were some of the workarounds? And what was the impact of this specific change? And we remember we want you to link a URL to an article that you found that covers the specific topic that you answer in question one. So if you're talking about digital film sets, you have all sorts of things that you can link. You can link a YouTube video, you can link an article, and that can be how you kind of express, so this is the change, this is what happened, here's the adaptation, and this is what it looks like in action. Here's a link to an article that I found about this topic, right? Now, number two is what potential advantages or disadvantages do you see because of the adoption of this technology, right? So we're looking at you to do some analysis. So if you're talking about digital film sets, we, some of the things that we mentioned today might be in your specific answer, like you're going to need fewer people, uh, you have complete control over location, uh, lighting, weather, and all of that sort of thing, so you no longer have to wait for your location to cooperate with your film shoot, you can shoot whatever you need to at any given time, right? So that's one of the major benefits of using digital film sets, and you can also inject your opinion because we're asking, do you see? So you can say that I think that digital film sets are beneficial because of X, Y, and Z reasons. I could also see it being used this way and this way and this way. And this goes for gaming, entertainment business, um, music production, and so on. Think of different ideas that maybe you've seen used in edge cases, or maybe you can imagine, okay, I'd imagine it being used this way, like my garage example for digital film sets. Whatever you want to include here, that's your opinion based on what you gleaned from your first answer and the article that you found. So this is more of an opinion-based question, just kind of thinking about what could you see as an advantage, maybe what's at a disadvantage. And some of this might involve extra research so that you answer this properly, but we just want to get your head, uh, get in your head about where you're seeing things in the future. Like we want you to have a kind of forward thinking mindset here for question two. And when you're applying to your classmates, definitely think about their answer, the technology that they included, it might be the same as yours. You can kind of compare and contrast in your reply, some of the things that they mentioned that you didn't mention, 
right? So definitely get in there and have at least a four to five sentence reply to at least one of your classmates. And we've got some thought starters here uh, and we are running out of time. So I'm not gonna go over these, but there are some thought starters here so that you can best formulate your response. And of course, this is the rubric that we're using, the rubric that we've been using all month. Make sure that you stay relevant to answering those topics, that you're being thorough and clear. So both for your initial post and your discuss, your reply, you want to contribute to the learning community by replying to at least one person, one of your classmates, and make sure that you do run spell checks so that you can earn the maximum of that 5% for your last discussion of the month. All right, so let's get to this final project here. I know you guys have been chomping at the bit for this one. There's a lot of information to go through. I'm going to go through all of it. I'm going to show you some examples, and then I'm going to take any final questions that you might have before we part ways this evening. Okay, so we covered an array of topics in your first month here at the LA Film School. We talked about information that you can find on the internet and how to analyze that information using search engines and their operators, studying industry professionals and their digital platforms, which we covered last week, reviewing your own use of digital platforms, which is something we also talked about last week. And this week we talked about making connections with digital communities and how the industry is adap adapting you know, two major technological changes, major societal changes, right? So our final project for this month is about contributing to the online world because you guys eventually, at the far end of your degree program, once you're in your field, you guys are going to be creating content. You are content creators, you're content creators, even though that is not your job title, you are making things so that people can be persuaded by them, entertained by them, informed by them, whatever it happens to be. You're going to be making stuff and putting it out there to the world so that the world can then respond to it, right? So we want you guys to kind of explore that sort of feeling of creating something for an audience, building something that is revolving around a topic um, that is specific to something that you learn and something that you've done research for, because again, that's going to be things that you're going to be doing in the industry uh, in a much more severe degree, much more, um, there's going to be a lot more on the line when you're doing it in your industry. So this is great practice to kind of get started with that sort of um, understanding where your mind is during the creative process. All right, so we're asking for you guys to create a project that will help someone understand digital literacy by explaining the topics that would benefit them with a creation from you, right? So you're building this for someone that doesn't know much about digital literacy, that has never taken the course. So think about nieces, nephews, older uncles, aunts, maybe your grandparents, maybe your parents who aren't as hip to technology and digital literacy. This is who you wanna aim this project towards because you're not gonna aim it towards us because we taught the course. You're not gonna aim it towards yourself, right? You're gonna aim it towards people that have no experience or little experience with this. So your, the impact of your creation will have the maximum amount of effect, right? You can get someone really interested in learning more about this. Okay, so for this project, you need to consider what digital literacy topic you would like to build your project around and how you would like to create it. So you can record a song that talks about search engines and operators. You can create a visual infographic about digital platforms. You can write a script. There's a lot of possibilities here. So you can do a lot. And we've got some matrices here, uh, some tables that will show you the different possibilities of the things that you can cover and the things that you can make, right? So we know everyone has different computers and gear at the start. So we know that might limit students from making create or creating certain types of files, and that's okay. Do what you can with what you have. So yes, know it. You can make a video. I'm going to get questions like that in chat. It, can I make this? Can I make this? The answer is almost certainly yes. But there are going to be some things that you want to keep in mind with scope. So yes, no, and you can make a video. Absolutely. We're going to go over all the different permutations very shortly. So do what you can with what you have. So if Noah, you don't have like a 4K camera or like a camcorder or anything like that, you can use your phone to shoot the video, right? We're not looking for you guys to go out of your way to rent equipment or to use studio equipment. We know a lot of you are waiting on your tech kit and that's when you can really start making cool stuff. Use what you have for this assignment. We're not grading you guys on how professional or creatively competent your work is. So if you wanna kind of keep scale low and make something very basic and get the project done and focus on that, you can. If you wanna get a little bit more involved and be creative with it and really kind of test your limits, you can do that too. But there are some things that we want you to keep in mind as you're pursuing your project. So do what you can with what you have. And we'll also highlight some free tools online, online tools that you can use to kind of bridge the gap a little bit if there's some things that you want to do but you don't have the software for it. So beside this content, you will also answer some questions about the book that you created 
and you will give us an explanation of the choice and process that you've made to create your projects. There's two parts. There's a written component and a creative component. And I'm going to show you what both of those things look like in the examples that I have for you. Okay, so when creating your, your project, please don't create any material that will be considered offensive by the general public, including sexually explicit material or excessive profanity. A general rule of thumb is to follow a PG-13 rating for the content and message of your submission. So we're not looking for you to do Care Bear, My Little Pony type, uh, cute, cutesy sorts of thing, right? We're looking for you guys to avoid being tasteless, right? We've had projects in the past where students are drawing, dropping Fs and Ss and Ds and Hs all throughout their project. And we're like, yeah, that's your creative expression, but how many actual productions have you seen where they're just cursing back to 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 back with no break in between, with no real substance involved, but you're just acting like a child with their language, right? We want you guys to avoid that. There are some television shows. I think Westwood has a lot of cursing in it. South Park has a lot of cursing in it, but it makes sense. If you're in the Wild West and you're some dude from the 1800s and you're grizzled and you have to sleep outside all the time, you're probably going to have a potty mouth. If you're a small child on a comedic television show and you're 2D cardboard, you're probably going to curse a lot because that's the intention of the creative, um, um, the creators, right? It makes sense for those things to be obscene or a little bit more explicit. But if you're just using curses just to have them in your project and it serves no creative purpose and you're just doing it to kind of be edgy or push the limits of what's acceptable, you want to avoid that because that's kind of creatively bankrupt. We've seen it a million times before. I'm sure you guys have seen it a million times before. Definitely avoid the most commonly tread path. Try to be as creative as possible, but you do have some room to introduce mature topics in a tasteful way. We don't want you guys to just make something super cutesy and colorful because that might not be your style. It's not my style, right? So keep this in mind, PG-13 rating, not a PG, not a G, PG-13. So you have a little bit of room to be serious with your project rather than making something that's maybe too cartoony or too sanitized and that's not your style, right? So if you have any questions at all about the content that you wish to include in your project, please contact your instructor and do it as early as possible because you only have six days to work on this. You have until Sunday night, it is Tuesday. Please let us know if there's anything that you might need uh, in terms of scope of your project, the topic that you're covering, how you're making it. If you have any questions about that beyond tonight, ask your instructor as early as possible. So here are some topics that you can consider. This isn't all of them, but this is most of them. So you can think about digital, being an online student, digital skills, using search engines, managing your digital self, finding a score or being scammed by a review, the digital self in general, digital communities, digital responsibility, networking with your peers, digital tools, blah, 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 so on and so on. There's a lot of things that we covered in the class and you can see them all here. So you can combine some of these. So you can combine search engines and the digital self to kind of be like, well, this is what you would search if you're looking for digital platforms to host your material or to join a new social uh, join a new social media website. You can also combine digital communities with networking with your peers and have those things kind of combined together. So yes, Noah, pick one of these, or if you can find two related topics, you can combine them together. You can kind of hybridize them. So yes, you will pick from one of these topics, um, but if you can find some smaller niche like I want to talk about specific digital skills instead of digital skills in general. Completely cool. I want to talk a, talk about a specific digital tool rather than digital tools in general. Completely cool, right? So you can dive deep on each one of these. You can put them together if you want to. You have a little bit of leeway with this, but just make sure that you pick something from the course that you want to create your project around, right? So definitely think about this. This is something we have to make a decision right now, but these are your options and you have quite a bit to choose from. So please contact us if you have any questions about a possible topic and I will gladly help. I can't tell you a single instance where a student has come to me with a topic question and I've said no. I can't think of a single instance. So if you're in this realm at all and you can justify what you wanna do, your instructor is probably gonna be on, on, on board with it, right? So part two, after you've chosen the topic, we want you to write down what you want to do with part two because this will help you in the creation process. Um, so using Word, Pages, or Google Docs, answer two of the following prompt, actually the two following two prompts about your creation and its purpose. And each prompt should be answered with a minimum of four to five sentences because we want to get in your mind 
on two levels. Who is this for and why are you making it? And those are the questions that you're going to be answering here. So what digital industry topic did you choose and why was this appealing or interesting to you? What makes this interesting about you? And then how can you kind of spin that on your specific audience? What major concept do you want the audience to learn after viewing your creation? Do you want them to be entertained, persuaded, informed about the specific topic that you've covered? And what's your topic? And why is it interesting to you? And how can you convert that interest into something that your audience might find interesting as well? So these are the questions that you're going to answer four to five sentences for each one. I have an example of what this looks like in addition to the, the actual creative project. So write this first, get this all down, because that can inform you in terms of what you want to work on in terms of your creative project. So utilizing your answers to prompt two, or in, your, to the prompts in part two, excuse me, determine what type of creation you wish to make best make to best convey your message. So what do you want to make based on how you answered these questions here? And your creation can take many forms. So you can write a song, just the lyrics. You can record the song and perform it if you want to. You can record a video of yourself or just record a general video and create a poster, a slideshow, an infographic. You can write a script. You can act out the script if you want to. You can create a short animation. You can write a script for a radio spot. You can create a storyboard. You can create a series of graphics or record an audio radio spot. You can even combine some of these. We have students who record a song and they include the lyrics. So they do both. Whereas you can just record a song with no lyrics and just do that. Or you can just write the lyrics and not record it if you don't feel like you're the best rapper or the best singer or whatever, right? So you can do either one or both of these. You can also do recording a video and writing a script. So if you want to actually play out your script on video with a friend or family member or with a voiceover, you can do that or you can do either or. So again, you have all sorts of options here and you can combine your options together if you want to. And you've got a, if you've got a creative idea, that's a little bit of this and a little bit of this. We don't want to constrain you guys, right? We also have some free online tools that you can use. So for audio, we've got Audacity. For video, we've got OpenShot. Image editing is GIMP. Graphics and video, you can use spark.adobe.com. We've got some script writing tools here, and we've got a storyboard uh, tool here with Canva. So if you're running with just your hardware at home and you're waiting on your tech kit, we don't want to leave you guys in the lurch. We have all sorts of things here that you can use. Uh, it's some new digital tools that we can teach you at the very end here, or you'll be learning these yourself. We don't have time to teach you these, but they're fairly easy to learn. But these are going to be your resources for creating rich media. If that's not something that you have access to, with the um, hardware that you have on hand right now. But if you want to use your phone for this, if you want to record music with your phone, if you want to use like a little beat application, if you want to record your video with your phone, if you want to build that up with the resources that you have, keep in mind again, that we're not going to be grading you on the professional quality of your output. We want you to first and foremost, have fun with this, uh, exercise some of your creative um, muscles, kind of solve some minor problems, that you will have in your creative field and be able to enunciate your creative ideas in a way that is going to be palpable to your instructors and gives you a clear vision for what you want your audience to do or understand after you've built your creation. You can kind of look at your answer, look at what you're building, and if those two things match up, you're going to be confident that what you're producing is on point for what we're looking for you to deliver. Now, this is where things get really important. So you can hybridize these topics, you can hybridize your tools, you can make what you want to, as long as you have these things in mind. So a digital literacy topic has to be the subject matter. It should explain the topic to someone who doesn't know much or anything about the topics covered in the class. So again, nieces, nephews, younger brothers or sisters, parents, uncles, grandparents, someone who's going to be outside that scope that you would consider, like they're not going to be totally on the ball about some of this stuff. You can teach them something new. And we also want you to connect it why it's beneficial to know about the topics covered in the digital literacy course. So um, what are you explaining? How is it important? And why is it beneficial to know this? So audio, video, and animation should be under two minutes in length just to keep scope involved uh, at the top of mind because you don't want to create a 10 or 20 minute video, run out of time. You have to upload it again to the, um, the class platform. And if it's five or six gigabytes and you start uploading at 9 p.m., that may or may not be enough time depending on your internet connection, right? So two minutes in length is what you wanna keep your videos under only because there's a lot of you and only a few of us. So we have to sit through movies back to back to back when it comes to time to grade. 
it can kind of drag things out. So we want you guys to use your creative. Um, we guys want, we want you to get creative with this time length here. So you only have a little bit of time to work with. So what you create should be impactful, as impactful as possible. Infographics, images, and posters should be legible and organized. Again, we're not looking for professional grade work, but we do want your information to flow logically and be easy to understand, as easy as understand as possible. Script should be at least two pages long because each page of a script is about one minute of a performance generally. And the storyboards need to contain at least 12 frames or shots to show a clear beginning, middle, and end for whatever scenario that you've got going on. So four for your beginning, four for your middle section of whatever it is, a skit, commercial, um, some sort of visual, and then four shots to kind of show how things conclude. And that's why we're looking for 12 frames here. So again, these are going to be your project requirements. They're going to be the minimum things that you need to hit. Um, maximum, so again, there's going to be like maybe a 30 second buffer for audio, video, and animations for their maximum. Two minutes and 30 seconds, you're probably going to be okay. A minute and 30 seconds, you're going to be mostly okay with your limit here. So try to stick around two minutes. If your animation or video is three minutes, you're pushing it. That's probably as long as that can possibly be. Uh, anything longer than that, you're probably going to lose points, but just because we asked you to adhere to a requirement. So if it's two minutes, 30 seconds, three minutes, you're okay. Minute, 30 seconds, you're good. If it's 45 seconds long, that's too short, right? So hang around two minutes as best you can. Uh, if it's a little bit over or a little bit under, you're going to be okay. But that's where you want to hang out. So that is everything that we have covered here in terms of the instructions. So for the submission process, please pay attention, guys, because we have someone that misses this every month and it's going to happen again. And I wish it wouldn't. So you want to make sure that you upload your creation and your supporting text document. So there's two things you need to submit. Some students create the submit their creative uh, submission and they forget their support explanation or they do the opposite. They wrote this part and they submitted it and it's great, but there's no creative component and we can't grade them on either on that either. So don't forget your um, both your creative submission and that's gonna be DGO creation, last name, first name and your support explanation, project support, last name, first name. This is gonna be a document. This is gonna be an MP3 file, a movie file, a JPEG, whatever it happens to be. Um, these, both of these things are gonna give you your full grade for your final project. You need both components here. And this is how we're scoring you. Requirements met for your chosen medium. So did you make an infographic? Did you record a song? Did you record a video? And go through all of that and then hit the project requirements that we were looking for. And did you include your support written statement? So that's 45 for the creative component, 45 for the written component. And then writing mechanics is gonna apply to both. So if you have written material in your creative project and there's a typo, you will lose points here. If there's typos in your creative statement, you will lose points here. So double check and um, double check your both your creative component if there's any sort of text involved and do the same thing for your written component as well so that you can maximize your score so that you can, again, earn your full 13% for your final project of the month. And that's all that I have for you. And I wanna show you guys one example while we are still together on the recording. And then I have a few more that I can show you after the recording is complete. Okay, so the first thing is here. I have an infographic that I'm gonna show you guys that looks like this. And the example statement looks like this. So these are the two components that we're asking for you guys to deliver, right? I get my preview out of the way here. It's my open word document. And here is my creative component. So this is everything. I just want to let you guys take it all in. This is what we're looking for you guys to deliver. So this is an infographic about personal and professional use of digital platforms. You can see some information here, icons, and some explanations here. So that's all well and good. And then we can see that there's an elaborate, far a little bit longer than what we were expecting for you to deliver, uh, elaborate explanation for why the student chose the specific project, this specific topic, and what major concept that uh, she or he wanted their audience to take from this. They even included a couple of citations here to, to kind of back up their information. You don't have to do citations for this, but if you wanna include them and you wanna stay careful, you can certainly do that. So just to kind of go in here and read a bit of her answer for both of these. So what digital literacy topic did you choose and why was this appealing? 
The digital literacy topic that I choose is the personal and professional use of digital platforms. Why this topic was appealing to me is because in week three, I learned how important it is to separate your professional and personal lives, especially when it comes to your online presence and how much a difference that can make in your career. So that's the beginning paragraph. And then she goes into more elaboration here. And then number two, what major concept did you want the audience to learn after viewing your creation? The concept that I would like my audience to learn is how important it is to separate your personal social media from your professional social media platforms. In addition, the first thing that will grab your attention is the title of the poster. And she kind of goes through some of the things here within this poster that elaborates on why this is important, what you're going to glean for, from it, and what she wants her audience to take away from this based on how she designed her infographic here, right? So this is essentially what we're asking for you to deliver for your final project. Something that you learned from the course, you're going to pick a topic, a digital literacy topic. You're going to write some information here about why that topic was important to you, on why it was interesting or appealing, or what really kind of resonated with you, how you want your audience to kind of pick up on that same thing that you were so interested in, and then how is that going to be expressed within your creative component here. And make sure that you submit both of these by this Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Pacific, because that will be the very last day that we can accept any work from week four. Anything after that, submitted after that, will not be accepted, right? So you only have six days left of the course. This has been a very, very quick September. I have appreciated each and every one of you that have visited with me, that have spoken with me, that have interacted with me over the last month. It's been a privilege teaching you guys, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and a wonderful remainder of the course.